Okay, we're going to look at an A-level topic here, which is particle physics. Now, this is a very, very large topic, and one which is constantly developing at the moment. So, um, so it's important we don't get too sidetracked into something which could absorb PhD after PhD. Um, <clears throat> I should just say that it's probably best to look at the sort of the how do we confine this topic that it's so large? And my advice would be the confines of the topic should be dictated by the textbook. Whoops. Um, the textbook. So do read your textbooks and have a look at how much uh, information is needed. In some instances, in some exam boards, you need to know about strange quarks, and others you don't need to know about strange quarks. But take a look and see um, what the textbook requires, and that's the confines of um, of it. Good. <coughs> this is going to be a first lesson, and so therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to have a recap of GCSE ideas. And in addition, we're going to add a few extra ideas before we move into the um, real business of particle physics. Okay, now, first of all, um, with a GCSE, they talk to us about the structure of the atom. And they enjoyed spending time explaining the, let me just put that, the plum pudding model. Uh, model and why that idea which was a positive dough with electrons randomly distributed in it um, and they took time to explain why that wasn't right and how understanding had moved on to the Rutherford model of the atom Now the Rutherford, just to remind you of what that is, it's a small nucleus with electrons running around the outside of it in different shells. Now, how did we move from one idea to the other, or how was the plum pudding model proved wrong? Well, that came about from an experiment, which was the Geiger-Marsden experiment. Geiger and Marsden. And essentially, what happened here is you're firing alpha particles into gold leaf. Gold leaf meaning very thin, and alpha, which I hope you know is a helium nucleus. And we probably took a long time to uh, explain that at GCSE and explain what was going on. Um, let me just get a video to explain what the Geiger-Marsden experiment is. Okay, so here is the experiment. I'm just going to zoom that up so you can see what it is. It's uh, First of all, it's taken from FET, an excellent website. Uh, do look at them. So this is the FET animation, and it's called Rutherford Scattering. And here are the alpha particles that are being shone onto a piece of gold leaf. And when we zoom up that piece there, you can see this is the nucleus, not the atom, this is the nucleus of gold. And here are the alpha particles. Alpha particles being two neutrons, the two white bits, and two protons, the two red bits. And here is the gold. And when we press play, you will look at the paths which these alpha particles take. Let's take a look at what we've got. There we go. Now I've placed in the paths so you can see, oh, and what I'm doing here is I'm turning up the um, kinetic energy. I'm gonna pause that there for a minute. Uh, so I just turned up the, the energy of the alpha particles. And as they come in, they're being deflected. The closer they are originally to the atom, the greater their deflection. And the further away they are to the nucleus, nucleus, sorry, not atom, the less deflected they are. Let's just take a look at those um, as they as they happen. 
there we go, and some of them make near head-on impacts, and then they get hugely um, uh, deviated. Some of them, if they're head-on, will bounce back as well. That's quite key. Now let me just uh, pause that briefly because we're going to change the structure now. And we're looking at, here is the nucleus, that tiny bit there versus the edge of the atom. And the edge of the atom are the electron clouds. You can see the type of scales, atomic scales, 10 to the minus 10. And now, because atoms rest on atoms, you see the separation of the nuclei is considerable. And so therefore, when we start up the animation, you will see that most of them travel straight through undeviated. One or two will have a huge deviation, but the majority will go through undeviated. Wonderful. That's what we're trying to get to. So those are the major conclusions from the Geiger and Marsden experiment. So what did that tell us? Well, that told us the following, that firstly, we had some alpha particles deviate a large amount. In other words, bounce back. And what does that mean? Well, that means that we have all the mass of the atom concentrated in a small nucleus. Good, what else do we have? Number two, we have most alpha particles. Oops, alpha particles travel through gold undeviated. So what does that imply? That suggests that most of the atom is empty space. And those two ideas meant that this model would not explain those results. What we did have, however, was this new model that some of the alpha particles deviate by a large amount, so all of the mass were inside a nucleus. So we have a nucleus, point one, and point two, the electrons float around the outside, thereby most travel straight through undeviated. Excellent. So that is essentially the GCSE knowledge recapped. Let's just put some sizes and scales to this, um, to this atom. It's important that we understand the width of about 10 to the minus 10 meter. If we then zoom up the nucleus, you'll probably see, let's take this to be, let's just say it's, um, helium, you'll know that we have two protons and two neutrons. Good. And the width of this is about 10 to the minus 15 meters. So we have this comparison of atomic radii versus nuclear nuclear radii. Wonderful. And of course I should just draw in there that we have the electron floating around the outside. But because this is helium and it's not an ion, we have four, two, the four indicating the total number of protons and neutrons, the two indicating the number of protons, and if it's a neutral atom, electrons.
Okay, good, right. Still going through this recap of GCSE knowledge. Let's take a look at the properties of those, um, of those, um, of those uh, particles. Let's take a look at what we have here. Let's look at the protons. Sorry about jumping around the screen here. Let's just look at the properties. Let's take a look at the proton, the neutron, and the electron. And I'm interested in the mass and the charge. These, of course, uh, should jump to mind. The proton has plus one mass and plus one charge. The neutron has plus one mass and zero charge. The electron has well, it's something like one over one eight sixty ish, effectively zero mass, but minus one charge. But when I say minus one plus one neutron, what do I actually mean by the one? Well, that means it is, in terms of mass, it has the same mass as a neutron. These are relative masses, not real mass, not one kilograms worth. Similarly, that's not one coulomb of charge. These are relative, so if that's a positive charge, then this is a negative charge just by one, and this has no charge. What it's important to note is if that is the relative, what is the real mass? And if that's the relative charge, what's the real charge? In terms of proton, we have 1.673 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. For a neutron, 1.675 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Incredibly small. Just very subtly different here. The 3 to the 5. That's worth noting for later. And in terms of the electron, we have 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And if we did the maths, the mass of a neutron divided by 1860 will approximately give the mass of an electron. So if I took this figure here divided by 1860, that will give me that figure there, which is the right order of magnitude, isn't it? That's about 3, because this comes out to be about to the minus 30. Okay, good. Right, what appear to be arbitrary numbers, but nonetheless. Okay, let's jump to charges. What's the charge on the proton? Well, let's go for the electron first. It's minus. So it's minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. If you're interested in why, how that figure came about, do look at it. Famous experiment, which is a brilliant experiment, but that was defined first. The proton is plus 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. I suppose for precision, I should probably write 0 0.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The two significant figures is important. And I've got zero coulombs happening there. Excellent. So what we want to see next, we want to talk about an, something which you probably haven't come across before. And that is the concept of antimatter. Now, antimatter, you're bound to have heard of. It has gained popularity in science fiction, even reporting in the newspapers as well. You just know what antimatter is. In effect, how it's defined is it is a particle with identical mass but opposite charge. To another um, uh, another particle. So for instance, if we had a eg, if we had an electron, then the anti is called a positron which has a plus one charge, but zero mass. 
as opposed to minus one and zero mass. These, interestingly, are the only two that have um, that have different names. Whereas if we had a proton, we would have an antiproton. Now, when I say opposite charge, in actual fact, that is something it has a different all quantum numbers. Um, of course, you don't know what that means necessarily, but what it effectively means is it's not just charge, it's everything else that's, that, that defines the particle is opposite. And so therefore, um, it's not as easy just to find something with an opposite charge that has the same mass. I mean, we might find something out there in the particle zoo that does that, but it has all quantum numbers that are different and opposite. But interestingly, what it does is that if a particle plus its antiparticle come together, then they will annihilate. And the annihilation means that the particles disappear. and are converted into energy. And that is a total conversion. Other examples, it's not, but that is a total conversion. And the energy often exists as a uh, a photon as an electromagnetic radiation. Photons. Good. Right. A little bit of history to this might be worthwhile actually whilst we're talking about it. There's um, initially um, this came about by the work of Paul Dirac And he actually holds the, um, he held the professorship of physics at Cambridge University before Stephen Hawking. However, he produced an equation. And his equation, which links quantum mechanics with relativity, and can be seen on the floor of Westminster Abbey, a little plaque around where all the great scientists are buried next to Newton, and gave um, four solutions, of which two were expected and real, and two were unexpected. And the unexpected implied antimatter. Now, he uh, didn't think antimatter existed, nor did anyone at the time, so actually this was ignored from his results until it was discovered by somebody else. And it was discovered um, by use of a bubble chamber, which is something which we will come back to, bubble chambers. But uh, let's show you the proof of that. And it came about from this wonderful, uh, simple picture along with its discoverer. Let me put that on that side so you can see this. Um, Carl Anderson. Here is the man here. I should say that actually it was discovered before. It just wasn't proven. So Carl Anderson proved it with this experiment here. It was seen at high energies, i.e. cosmic rays. But what we have taking place here is, you can see this track, which a particle is going through a bubble chamber. A bubble chamber is showing a track. So here is our track. And if a particle, particle were negative, that's the way it would bend. However, this one has shown a positive bending because it's sitting in a 
magnetic field. If you can see that. Going into the page. We won't talk about why, how it bends in that direction, but nonetheless. Um, you can see it's moving faster here because it's straighter, and then as it slows up, as it ionizes through this material, it then bends. And the radii of those two circles indicates, along with the strength of the magnetic field, that it has the charge of an electron, and it has the mass of an electron. But it's positive rather than negative. And so therefore, antimatter was discovered. And you've probably seen it, of course, uh, popularized in things like uh, angels and demons, where they hold the antimatter as a, as a device. Good, okay, now. Why did I go to all the, um, that extent of explaining? Whoops, let me just shrink the screen a bit, if I can. Why did I go to that extent of explaining what antimatter is? Well, this point here is really useful. The concept of annihilation. And the concept of annihilation, the particle disk being converted into energy, actually harnesses one of Einstein's great ideas. That is energy is mass times the speed of light squared. The idea that energy and mass are one and the same thing. Now what does that mean that energy and mass are the same thing? Well that means if we took a quantity of mass, and we had a total conversion to energy, the quantity of that energy would be, some, would, be, uh, would be equated by this equation here. This only occurs in matter-antimatter interactions. But nonetheless, mass and energy are one and the same thing. Okay, a few... Um, okay, so let's, let's bear that in mind first and work out therefore what the masses of different particles are in a slightly different way. Here goes. Find some pen. Now, um, if we look at a proton, we know that it has a mass of 1.673 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Okay. Now, what we're saying, therefore, the mass is the energy divided by the speed of light squared. What I've done is I've just done a small manipulation of that equation. Um, so, interestingly, kilograms are also the same as joules per meters per second squared. Technically, they're identical. And so therefore, rather than writing something as a kilograms, particle physicists like to write things in terms of energy per c squared. So that's what we're going to try and do. We're going to change this mass here into an energy per c squared. So what do we do first? Well, what is the energy of a proton if it were totally being converted uh, if the mass were totally converted into energy, it would be 1.673 times 10 to the minus 27 the mass multiplied by the speed of light. And I know this is 2.998 or what have you, but as good as. Let's multiply that out. And that should give us something in the order of um, let me just type it into the calculator. That gives us 1.51 times 10 to the minus 10 joules. Wonderful. Uh, not large, but it's a tiny start point, a tiny mass, which has considerably grown in terms of energy. Okay, right. 
Now, just hold that thought briefly, because I'm going to talk about one more thing. In an electrical circuit, and bear with me here, if I have a 5 volt supply, then what 5 volts means is that if this were a coulomb, then it would hold 5 joules, 5 joules on every coulomb. So therefore, what we say with electrical theory is that the, the potential difference, or the voltage, is equal to the work done divided by the charge. Now, if we have an electric field, if we had, sorry, sorry, let's, let's use the vocabulary that we're familiar with. Let's imagine I had two plates which were charged to a certain voltage. And let's say that this one was the positive plate and this one was the negative plate. Then a positive particle would accelerate until it struck that plate. Now, if it's accelerating, it's gaining energy. So how much energy, what would be the work done on that particle it moved through? Well, interestingly, if I just manipulate this equation up here, that's going to be the potential difference multiplied by the charge. In other words, it's going to be the potential difference multiplied by the charge on the electron. So if I were to have, for instance, let's put some numbers into this, if I would have 100 volts, and this were a proton, what would be the energy gained? Well, that would be 100 times 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, which gives me 1.6 times 10 to the minus 17 joules. Okay. What happens if I used an electron and it was one volt. Then that would give me one by 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, giving me 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now, 1.6 10 to the minus 19 equals one electron volt. This is what particle physics love to use as a unit. It's given that number, it's one electron volt. And you can see the theory is how we got there. If I had, um, if I wanted one mega electron volt, then that would be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. Because remember, mega is 10 to the six, it's a million. So if I multiplied this by a million, I'd get to there. Perfect. Now. Memorize that. That's important. It's the same as the charge on the electron, just with joules, so memorize that. Now let's jump back a bit. And let's say to ourselves, ah, now I've got the energy of a proton. Let's say mass of a proton, so the energy of a proton. in joules. But now I want the energy in electron volts. So what do I do? Well, I take the energy of the proton and I divide it by one electron volt. So that gives me 1.51 times 10 to the minus 10 divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And that gives me 9.41 times 10 to the 8 electron volts. Or indeed, it could be 941 mega electron volts. Fantastic, that's approximately 1 giga electron volt. So let's just uh, go through that again. This is an aside explaining an electron volt. But what we do is, 
particle physicists love giving energies, masses in terms of energies. And so therefore what we've done is we've worked out the mass of a proton in terms of the energy. And so therefore what I can say is that the mass of this is technically nine for one mega electron volts per c squared because that gives me the mass but what we do is physicists just keep uh, just a bit lazy and they never really say that bit Excellent. okay whilst we're at it let's try now to work out the mass of an electron in a similar way so if you think you can do it go for it give it a go otherwise here comes the answer what about the electron okay we have the energy is mc squared which gives us 9.11 times 10 to minus 31 by 3 times 10 to the 8 squared 8.2 times 10 to the minus 14 joules now I want to convert that and put that into electron volts so the energy in terms of electron volts is going to be energy in terms of joules divided by one electron volt, which gives us 8.2 times 10 to the minus 14, divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, which gives us 5.12 times 10 to the 5 electron volts, which is the same as 512 kilo electron volts. Or to be more precise, kilo electron volts per c squared would be the mass of the electron. Okay, memorize those. They're really important. Um, they will get you out of a jam when you need them. 1 GV, 5, 11, rather than 5, 12, KV. Mass of the proton, mass of the electron. Good. Right, let's bind all that together with one example. So let's say we had an electron and a positron coming together and they both held 100 kilo electron volts of kinetic energy each. They come together and they annihilate. I said before that what happens when they annihilate is they give off raw energy, which is given off by two photons or EM radiation, which is a photon And, I mean, importantly, there are two of these to conserve momentum. We'll come back to that, more of it later. But they're coming together, bang, production of energy, raw energy. I should probably just write that as big E. And then we have two photons going off back to back. Um, and what's the energy of each of those photons is the question. Well, if you think you know the answer, uh, write it down. But here comes the answer. So the energy, well, first of all, we need to work out what the total energy of the system is. And there we have two lots of kinetic energy plus two lots of the energy of the mass of the electron and the proton. So that gives us two lots of 200, sorry, jumped the gun a bit there, 
of 100 electron volts plus two lots of 511 kilo electron volts. Remember, this is the mass of the electron per c squared. It's quite useful. You see how we're doing this, adding these together. And that gives us a total of 1222 kilo electron volts. Right, what happens next? Well, we have two photons which must carry away the 222 kilo electron volts. So each photon must carry away 611 kilo electron volts. Okay, I hope that made sense. I suddenly thought maybe it's probably worthwhile to put those next to the masses of the properties. So if I were to write here, extra charge for masses, or indeed, hold on, let's see if I can do this. Let's, uh, no, that's not going to work. Let's um, just add them. The mass is here. We have for a proton approximately one giga electron volt. Neutron, one giga electron volt. Approximately 511 kilo electron volts. It's quite useful. Right. Now, last bit of new information based on what we knew at GCSE. Let's go back to properties of radiation at GCSE. So let's Okay, three types of radiation. Alpha, which is given the symbol 42, but it's a helium nucleus, so it's a two plus ion. And the importance of alpha, oh, to describe it, sorry, let's describe it, which is a helium nucleus. And if something were to alpha decay, and let's take uranium-238, the fairly, the non-fissionable type, and let's say that react, that decays by alpha, then what we got left? We have thorium, that's 90, I know that, and that's 234. You can see here that those must add up, and those must add up on both sides. Wonderful, what's happened? Out of the nucleus comes two protons and two neutrons, giving it a four total mass comes out, and therefore these reduce. Wonderful, makes sense. What about beta? A beta is a fast moving electron. Um, and so therefore it's a, um, a electron or it's got high kinetic energy. Um, but the decay is quite strange. Let's take carbon-14, which I'm familiar with, carbon-6. If we take away a beta, minus one, zero, then because of the way in which we add these up, 14 plus zero means I've got to be left with 14 here. But if I were to do the same here, six minus one must leave me with seven. So I've got seven, so that's actually nitrogen. But what on earth is going on there? Because I seem to have created out of nothing a proton in this reaction. Well, actually what's going on is that a neutron drops out and that is changed into a proton plus an electron. The electron shoots off to become beta the proton is retained in the atom and therefore changes the structure of that nucleus because this number defines what element we have. This number defines whether it's heavy or light, an isotope. So the total mass hasn't changed because you've lost a neutron but you've gained a proton. Okay, now that's, that looks a bit odd. We're going to explore this in much greater depth.
as we go um, as we go on to the next uh, few lessons. However, for the moment, I want to share with you another bit of history and another interesting development. Okay. Now, when this was observed experimentally, it um, gave rise to a certain number of results. Um, apologies that this uh, picture here is dark. No, let me uh, get another better one for you. Slightly darkened image, but here we go. That's right. Now, what we're looking for, what, what this shows us here is that in this reaction, let's just take this one. Well, actually, it uses copper 64. Um, you will get beta emitted. But the, you'd imagine with such a defined um, equation, you've got a starting nuclei, starting nuclei, you've got the new one, which you know where, it, where it's going, and you've got the beta given off, you would imagine that this would have a precise energy. But there's a range of energy. Most often the energy occurs around here. But some has more, some has less. And that didn't make any sense. What they were expecting was, was a precise energy, the energy of the beta particle. So what on earth has gone on here? Then? Well, what it means is, and that's why you've probably got these things shown here, is that they were saying that actually the reason why that the majority of the energy that they're seeing somewhere around there, sorry for the lack of straight line, this energy here. The remainder of the energy there, I mean, where has it gone? Well, this has been given to another particle. This energy has gone to the beta, and this has gone to another particle. Now that is a big revelation. What they're suggesting is that when a neutron turns into a proton and an electron, or a beta, should we write that as a beta, then actually another particle is produced. A tiny neutral particle. And the phrase that was coined was a new Trino. It doesn't have a charge and it doesn't have a mass. Which makes it incredibly hard to see. But the reason why you know it exists, well it has subsequently been found, but the reason why you know it exists is because not all of the energy, or in most often, only a bit of the energy is seen and another particle has taken away the remaining bits. Okay, that's really important. In actual fact, if I'm being really precise, this must be an anti-neutrino. The bar across the top indicates antiparticle. Wonderful. Okay, I think we've covered enough there really in this one lesson. Let me uh, let me just go over and recap for you all where we've come from and where we've got to. Whoops, just drag that down. So let's go back to starting out from structure of the atom you know that plum pudding model no longer exists because the Geiger master experiment, we talked about the results coming through to the Geiger master experiment and that has yielded the Rutherford model of the atom. We then moved on from Rutherford to appreciate that um, the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons and how we work those out from, um, from the periodic table and these ranges as well, they're really important, 10 to the minus 10 versus 10 to the minus 15, versus indeed, I suppose, 10 to the minus 18 meters. We think that's point like the electron. And 
Then we talked about the properties of each of those relative masses, relative charges, because that's what we remember for GCSEs, but then the real values. We talked about how antimatter exists historically, um, and a little bit of interesting history there, but more importantly, the ideas of Einstein. Let me attribute this to the great man. And the energy mass conservation idea and how we could re-express the masses of protons, electrons, or any particle in terms of, rather than joules, in terms of mega electron volts per C squared, because we're lazy, we say mega electron volts. And we did a little proof as to what they were. And we then talked about what happens if we had an annihilation of matter and antimatter how we work that out. Finally, we talked about properties of radiation and most interestingly, what's going on here as a neutron, something subatomic, decays into a proton and gives off a beta particle or a fast moving electron and how that can't just have been the only particle given off because though you can't see it, there must be this extra particle, the neutrino, the tiny neutral thing, the neutrino, because the energies given off are not exact quantities, but a range. Super. I think we'll stop there, ready for lesson two later.